I like to talk about tech stuff. And I was thinking about the Jetsons, and I was thinking about the future, and what technology is going to be used for senior living in the future. And I was like, why don't we just do something called what would George Jetson do? And really, the bulk of my speech is, is basically what we're going to have all this at-home technology now, and we don't really want them, the people in this audience really don't want them at home. We want them with y'all. And so what are some of the trends and some of the sort of sideways thinking that we can, we can do to move them from their house to y'all? And what are some of the sort of mega trends that are going to happen? I'm going to go off topic a little bit and talk about money and some things like that. But really what I'm talking about is are these technologies that are going to go in the home, are they competing with y'all to keep people at home? Or in the end, can they sort of augment what y'all are offering? So that's what I'm going to talk about today for a few minutes. Uh, how many of y'all have visited the villages? That's the real reason I, Mike and I got in this conversation, because I told him, I was like, I'm moving down to the villages. I'm just going down there. I'm single. I'm just going to live down there. At least I know there's some form of security down there. I live in Augusta, Georgia right now. My kids are about to go to college. And I'm like, I think I'm going to go down there. And, uh, and I'm sort of a shut-in anyway, by the way, speaking of technology at home. Sometimes I throw random slides around. How many of y'all use Instacart? Have y'all ever used it? Isn't it wonderful? They just, you just order, and that's essentially, you see what I live on, basically bread, chicken, cat food, <laughs> Coke, and eggs. That's my diet. I just do the same order pretty much every time. But I've developed a lifestyle to where I just kind of don't have to leave the house, which, um, as Steve was saying, I've, I've been, I'm a little bit jet lagged, had 32 flights this month so far. And so when I get home, I tend to stay home and not go out. And I was thinking about, all right, when I get older and I go home and I want to stay home, what are the tools that are going to enable me to stay home? By the way, this is another shot of the villages, which I'm not sure makes me want to go live there or just not go live there at all. They say the villages is actually a uh, drinking community with a golfing problem. <laughs> That's what people call the villages. But it kind of appeals to me, and people are actually very happy there. It's very interesting. They're youngish, and they're happy. I'm 56. I guess you can go when you're, when you're 55, and I'll probably, my youngest uh, is going off to college when, a, he, when I'm 57, so I reckon I'll be going over there when I'm about 57, 58. My mom was at Brandonwild in Augusta. How many of y'all have heard of Brandonwild? It's a, yeah, Brandon Wild's a, a great facility, and she was there, and it was funny when she went, she and all her friends just all moved there at the same time. I mean, I know there's a social aspect to it, but they just, she and her 10 best friends just got up and all moved and all lived there, and we actually had a wonderful experience at that place. I, it couldn't have asked, she lived the last 20 years of her life there, and I couldn't have asked for anything better. And that's one thing that's really gotten me sort of interested in all this. These are papers. There's lots of papers coming out now. And this is digital technology to enable aging in place. And aging in place seems to be the new sort of buzzword now. For y'all, aging in place means not being in y'all's facilities, right? And so I wanted to take a look at aging in place and just examine it, see what's keeping people there and what might bring them to a facility. Raise occupancy rates. 90% of seniors, I'm sure you've seen this, prefer to stay in their homes as they age. And they're aging longer now. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Boy, that's a tiny little old slide. Can you tell I wrote a book on PowerPoint? I can't even read that. But the point is research is flowing to areas concentrated on keeping people at home. So a lot of academic research is doing that. Capital is flowing there. I've actually measured it. And it seems to be that more capital is flowing towards that area than towards the, uh, the senior living facilities themselves. And this is actually from, I think this is from angel.co, but there are 436 uh, venture projects, serious venture projects that are basically dealing with aging in place right now. So there is a lot of money and interest going into keeping people in their homes, which like I said, is not necessarily uh, what we want to happen, and technology is flowing to areas which is concentrating on keeping people at home 
rather than moving into a, a senior living facility. Now I'm going to take a left turn here, but it'll make sense when we get back to the end. This is the game of Go. And how many of y'all have seen this documentary on Netflix? It's a, have, how many of y'all have Netflix? <laughs> Watch this, please. It's like the best documentary on Netflix. And what it is is when Lisa Dole played Go against the deep mind computer of Google. All right, and the, everybody thought Lisa Dole, because Go is such a complex game, way more complex than chess, people thought that, well, Lisa Dole, you know, he'll just kill it. But in move 37 of game two, uh, the computer pulled out something nobody had ever seen before, and it freaked Lisa Dole out, and he had to leave. He went outside, smoked a cigarette, could not figure out what happened because the computer made an innovation that he had not seen before, and it completely freaked him out, and he lost the game. How many of y'all play Go at all? Don't. It's for boring people. But, <laughs> but a, lot of, of, uh, a lot of magazines said this very same thing you see at the bottom was Move 37, the move of the computer, the seminal moment in human development. All right, that's a pretty strong statement. And I'm going to come back to that later and tell you all what in the world he's talking about. Anyway, there they are. There are the Jetsons. There's George Jetson and Rastro and Rosie the Robot and all those type of people. So when George Jetson gets a little bit older, the title of my speech is, What Would George Jetson Do? Well, the first thing we know is that George Jetson is going to live a lot longer than we thought he was going to live. Ray Kurzweil, who's the head of, well, He's chief officer at Google in charge of defeating death. Has basically said, if you make it to the year 2038, you'll live to be 120 years old because that's the moment at which technology is going to be able to keep us alive a lot longer. If you want to see how we're all going to turn out, just take a look at Japan and or South Korea. Older senior citizens in Tokyo are growing by 300,000 every blank years. That's every five years is how, that's how many just in Tokyo, and that's older senior citizens, that's 75 plus. That's 75 years plus. It's a real problem. When I was, I was born in 62, so roughly when I was born in 1960, this is the pyramid population, and look where we are in 2060, where we're gonna be 100 years later. Half the people are essentially gonna be over 40, and look at the phenomenal amount, they're gonna be 65 and above. Our world is about to change, but it's changing so slowly that people are really not noticing it yet, I don't think. They're not really, it really hasn't sunk in, the fact, but I've noticed it. It seems like, you know, when you're 65, have you noticed that people's parents are still alive when, you know, let's say if I turn 65, you know, there's a good chance my parents would be alive, and that's not an unusual thing. That used to be an unusual thing. Uh, in 2035, the number of adults 65 and over is going to outnumber the number of children under 18. So we are a completely graying society, which is great for y'all. It means y'all can build things, but what's not great for y'all is if people decide to stay at home for a long, long time. By the way, this is taken out to the year 2030, and you'll see that 40% of the world's population will be over 80 years of age because uh, birth rates, there's crashing birth rates, which is what's going on in Japan, too. Uh, you're having people living way long and not having, the children aren't having uh, babies at all. Uh, aging in place, despite a growing older population, the number of nursing home residents in the United States has fallen as people find more ways to live at home longer. So I wanted to kind of examine these type of things. All right, this pretty lady, don't laugh, I love this lady. She lived at home almost her entire life, all right, and she was... I think she finally went to a facility when she was like 112. She smoked till she was 109. Okay, she, she died not that long ago. She smoked until she was 109, and the only reason she stopped smoking is because she was so blind that she kept lighting her hair on fire when she would light her cigarettes, right? But all these people were like, don't smoke, don't do this, don't do that. Well, she pretty much proved them wrong, and she lived at home most of her life. But there's nanotech things that are keeping us uh, living longer. Uh, happy accidents, uh, pharmaceutical accidents. I'll show you all uh, in a few minutes some happy accidents. This is sort of a happy accident, I guess, as you get older. 
Uh, the, the red line is women, the blue line is men, and what this, there was a study that came out recently and showed that if you're a man and you marry younger, uh, it increases your lifespan. If you're a woman, the younger you marry, the quicker you die. <laughs> so, ladies in the audience, if you want to live to 100 or 120, just don't be going out with any guys, and, which means probably you don't want to live at the villages, because y'all have heard about that whole loofah thing at the villages, haven't you? Have y'all heard about that? Yeah, <laughs> you shouldn't have heard about that, sir. Uh, depending on, you know, there's 40,000 golf carts at the villages, right? God, does anybody from the villages work here? Is anybody here from the villages? Anyway, <laughs> it, <laughs> there's 40,000 golf carts there. And, uh, in fact, Mike and I talked about I should probably bring a loofah up on stage. But if you're wearing, if you are on your golf cart, if you're driving around with a certain color golf loofah, and I think it's purple, that means you are ready to go that day. All right? Also, if you're at Publix at the Villages and you have a pineapple turned upside down in your cart, that also means you're ready to go that day, which may mean why there are apparently three STD clinics at the Villages because these people are just, they're having more fun than anybody in the world, apparently, which is another reason why I want to go there. Um, <laughs> Drinking a cup of coffee may add nine minutes a day to your life, which means that every day I'm adding approximately 270 minutes <laughs> to my life. Greatest thing I ever got was an espresso machine. Do y'all have, anybody here have a Nespresso machine? Oh my God, it's a life changer. I'm putting it next to my bed. I don't want to have to move in the morning. I just want it, it's just the greatest thing ever. Um, this, I wanted to mention y'all to this in terms of this should go in your facilities, but also because I find it to be very interesting. There are a lot of studies out of Finland, and this, this is talking about living longer. There are a lot of studies out of Finland which show that, ooh, that's a boring slide. Here's the thing. If you hit the sauna at least four times a week, you're 60% less likely to suffer a stroke over the next 15 years. So if you hit the sauna, for what, what it really is, if you hit 170 degree sauna uh, for 20 minutes four times a week, it basically cuts your risk of having a stroke in half. Isn't that amazing? And I think it may have something to do with vasodilation. It may have something to do with stressing your system. I'm not sure what it is, but it's kind of crazy that that works. And the other thing that it does, if you look at that last um, paragraph, Fatal cardiovascular disease is not the only disease reduced by sauna use. The men who used the sauna two to three times a week had a 24% lower all-cause mortality rate. All right, if you use it four to seven times a week, you have a 40% lower all-cause mortality rate. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, if you, and there's another study out showing how racket sports also make you live a lot longer. So if you want to live to be 100 years old, you see these guys playing tennis out here, basically take up tennis or racquetball and go to a sauna and you will absolutely, I'm not kidding, you will actually live forever. I've been looking at this for a while because I've been working on this project called Age Invaders, talking about, you know, people, the graying of the population. And it's amazing. So, oh, I forgot coffee. So drink coffee, do a sauna, play tennis, live to 120 be a happy person, and it also, sauna use decreases uh, dementia, which is, I don't know about y'all, but that's my single biggest fear as I get older of something happening to me. You know, you, the, your biggest fear, of course, is something happening to your children, but my dad had Alzheimer's, and it's not something I really want to have happen to me. I think genetic tinkering in terms of lengthening or, or repairing something called telomeres is going to keep us alive a lot longer, as is the fact now that uh, about 12 years ago, if I wanted to get my genome sequenced, it would cost $10 million. Now, if I want to get my genome sequenced, it's about 99 bucks. How many of y'all have gotten y'all's genome sequenced from 23andMe? Yeah, mine told me two important things. One, that I was going to get glaucoma, which wound up being true. And, well, it told me two other things. Um, that I was going to probably be a cat owner, which I am, and that I have a GG genotype, which means neither exercise nor dieting 
is going to affect my weight, which I call the free pass gene. I love that gene. <laughs> happy as a pig in mud. But here is really the solution to all our problems, is, uh, is we are decoding Ozzy Osbourne's genome to see what in the world is making that guy live as long as he can live. Although you and I both know, or all several hundred of us know, it really needs to be Keith Richards, not Ozzy Osbourne. Another thing that's going to keep us alive longer is drug prices are just collapsing. So, so statin prices are collapsing. Things are going to, lots of exogenous things are going to keep us alive a lot longer. And now it's turning out that statins have uses that we weren't aware that statins has, have. Also, um, how many of y'all, well, no, that's a medical question. It's a violation of HIPAA. There's a diabetes uh, drug, anti-diabetes drug called metformin, which lowers your glucose level. Have y'all heard of this? Metformin, it's, about, it's, it's generic, it's about five bucks a pill, or five cents a pill. And they're thinking now, they, they found after studying that people that take metformin live longer, have fewer cardiovascular events, and in some studies are less likely to suffer from dementia and Alzheimer's. This little five cent pill, remember how I was talking about happy accidents? This little five cent pill may make people live a lot longer and Louis Cantrell, the director of the Cancer Center at Weill Cornell Medicine, which is a pretty reputable place, said metformin, this five cent drug, may already have saved more people from cancer deaths than any drug in history. I mean, I'm taking just experimentally from, I got my doctor to write it for me so we can measure my glucose levels and we're gonna measure it again in about a month. And I'm really interested to see what's going on, but all these things are converging to make people live longer, which should be great for y'all, except they're living longer at home. I talked to y'all about Japan. That's a misplaced slide. Now, how I'm going to frame the final 26 minutes of my speech is I'm going to frame it around a study that was done in Britain about what uh, older people are worried about, all right? The first thing they're worried about, that's about 20% of people are worried about money, and they should be because so many people are outliving their money. In South Korea, there's a real problem of not being able to support the older people in society because they've, they've spent all their money uh, educating their children. Here it is. They spent vast sums into their children's education, leading them strapped in later life. And if you go back, you see life expectancy is increasing radically in South Korea. So they have not saved for the lifespan they were expecting to have, and they certainly didn't save for the, life, for the lifespan that they're going to have. There's a, a big thing going on now. I speak to a lot of financial groups, and what people are concerned about right now, the main thing on a lot of people's minds, and it used to be everybody wanted to go out and let's get the millennials, and now you know it's how can we help people live on the money that they have? which is another reason, money is another reason why people may stay at home longer than you expect. Japan is having the same problem, their elderly care bill, they don't know how in the world they're gonna pay for it all. Now, baby boomers have most of the money now, and that's the generation that's going to be uh, coming up, and we say they're going to be retiring soon, but really, are they gonna be retiring? Because are they going to be able to afford to retire? because, uh, I mean, it costs several, y'all know this, it costs tens of thousands of dollars a year to stay in certain types of facilities. And if you're living 20 years longer than you thought you were gonna live, that's a problem. Um, this is just a random statistic, but I thought it was interesting. In 2035, $1.5 trillion in securities will be held uh, by people in Japan with dementia, all right? I just think it's, it's a curious societal problem that I hadn't thought through yet. One thing that's going to happen for older folks, one application of technology at the home, is something called intelligent financial agents, which is an AI, an artificial intelligence, like y'all didn't know what AI was, an artificial intelligence that basically looks at your income, looks at your bills, looks at when that Coca-Cola dividend might hit, looks at all sources of income and says, all right, we need to pay this bill this day. We need to hold off paying this bill to the last minute and pay it on this day. This much money's coming in then, so by this date, we'll be able to afford uh, a certain type of vacation. It's called an intelligent financial agent, and I think that's what's gonna help older people a lot deal with their money. It's not gonna be people helping them, 
with their money, although I firmly believe that uh, senior living centers should put more emphasis on helping people manage their money, but there's going to be an explosion of intelligent financial agents, AIs, that are running people's money for them and, and balancing the ins and outs better for them, which is going to help in, if people are living way, way longer in terms of balancing uh, their money flows. The pension system as it is is just simply not going to support our population if, uh, well, the pension system it is just isn't going to it ain't going to do it, especially if a lot of these pension plans uh, go broke. Some of the government plans, things like that. People are really, a big worry is outliving your money. My mom's biggest worry was, am I going to outlive my money? And happily, she didn't. But that's a big thing that she and her friends really worried about. One of her friends lived to be 102 and just worried about it the entire time I knew her, worried about it for 20 years. So you can't depend on the pension system. And it used to be when I started with Smith Barney when I was 22 years old, you could get a treasury bond, a 30-year treasury bond that paid 18%. Boom, all your problems are solved. Well, treasury bonds now, what seniors are faced with is the fact that their money really doesn't compound anymore. People are sort of being forced into stocks. And because I'm the most boring human being on planet Earth, I've read this book, A History of Interest Rates. And what's interesting about that to me is uh, interest rate declines like we're going through now can last a really long time. The one we're going through now has lasted about 15, 10 to 15 years so far, I guess. This one lasted 145 years. So we can't count on higher interest rates providing income for senior citizens to help pay their bills and pay for their senior living in the future. We cannot count on that. Something else has, has got to happen, and it's not going to be Social Security. I'm completely sure, in fact, they're going to change within the next 15 years. They're going to change the age for, at first they'll start off at 70, but then I think it'll go to 75, the age that you'll collect Social Security, because the way it is right now, we have 10 workers supporting every two retirees. That's the dependency ratio. But in 30 years, we're going to have four workers supporting every two retirees. All right, And that's just unsustainable because that means the young people that are working are paying out a huge portion of their income to pay for people that are on the Social Security system. So what I think is going to happen, one thing that may keep people in the house, I think is going to happen is people are going to get back in the workforce in earnest. I think they are really going to go back to work which uh, I think I have a slide on this later, but if in y'all's facilities, y'all create environments which almost like Regis, I'm saying this in case I forgot to put this slide in, but it's like almost if you had a Regis business center type environment in your facilities to help people do their work, uh, that might be a good thing because they are gonna be working later and later. This was a friend of mine, his name was Curly Watson. Uh, he practiced medicine until he was 103 years old. All right, it was just a normal thing, but 103, and then one day he just fell over and died. And, um, but he didn't want to stop working, and, and, you know, and so he didn't. But I think more and more people are going to be working because they have to. All right, so that's money. Uh, one, of the big, one of the top two things that people are worried about, obviously, is health. And, and there are lots of technological sort of uh, there are things coming out to help people with their health. Uber Assist obviously is going to help get older people to the doctor if they're living home or if they're at uh, a facility. But once I said, lots of money is really flowing in to these areas. Uh, Best Buy is testing a service called Assured Living to help the aging population stay healthy at home. It's not just them. It's all it's Philips. It's big, huge corporations. Microsoft are devoting huge dollars into technology to figure out how to keep people aging in place, which is a problem. They're having conferences on investment opportunities in the longevity marketplace. Um, I read a paper recently on frailty because, you know, when you're living at home, one of the things you're worried about the most is the fact that you have a, you, you live in a, a sort of frail state. Well, isn't this kind of cool? This is new. But there are exoskeletons being made that will help you get, if you're a little bit frail, they help you get around and walk during your day. Isn't that kind of neat? 
So it's clothing that literally will support you, like support hose, only more. But it's, it's things that will, it's an exoskeleton that will help older Americans get around. There's one now you can wear on your wrist, and people with Parkinson's, it's got a gyro on it, people with Parkinson's, when they're signing things or doing tasks, it actually steadies their hands, all right? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Had y'all heard about wearing exoskeletons at home? It's, it's, it's going to happen. Um, predictive software is one thing that I look at a lot. And just through use of your iPhone, letting your iPhone or this guy, your, your watch, uh, measure your gait, it can infer, given enough information, it can infer um, if you're getting physically to a state where you're going to be prone to falling. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about, about all this, there's the picture of it, about these sort of big data things right now. But that's over time, and this isn't like you don't use it for a day, but over time it measures your frailty in terms of your gait and whether or not you're more prone to falls. Everything is all about data now, all right? That's, I tell people that all the time. And one company that's doing a lot of good work in terms of, you know, Google says don't be evil. Well, in terms of seniors, they're really not being evil. They're doing lots of things. They have lots of projects going on that, as far as I can tell, aren't really there to make money. They're there to help people, and they're, they're there to sort of help people manage and assess data. And most of the data we're going to have people in the next few years, because electronic health care records were mandated seven years ago, we pretty much all have an electronic health care record now, so there is a huge repository of data on each of us that can be studied and problems can be identified, and people can use those to either age in place or y'all will be able to use them in y'all's facilities. And this paper just came out this year, in fact. It's a Google paper. It came out in January. And um, basically what they did was they took raw EHR records without the names on it, and they worked with 200, they had 216,000 patients who they studied. They had 46 billion data points, all right? There's a lot of data being collected on people. And what they were able to find out was they were able to predict with a high degree of accuracy uh, in hospital mortality, unplanned readmissions, which if you have, if you have a patient in your facility who's kind of going in back and forth to the hospital, this is actually valuable data to know, and who might have a prolonged length of stay. So now, with a high degree of confidence, the data that's contained in electronic healthcare record, which y'all are going to have access to, can, can give y'all information that's important to have. Um, remember DeepMind I talked about earlier playing Go? Well, DeepMind is actually the AI that's behind a lot of this. This is Google's, um, this is Google's AI, AI that studies huge data sets, and they've got one they're using in Britain now in hospitals, which is really interesting, and it would especially be interesting in nursing home facilities, because what it does is it predicts um, kidney problems. Uh, it's based on, there's a normal AKI, uh, acute kidney injury algorithm, and, but what it does is, and this is the algorithm, that's a boring slide. I'm not going to go through that slide, by the way. That, that one's just a little too much for me. But here's what I want you all to see. In the red, if certain things happen with patients, the key to this is not, is not predicting that they're going to have acute injury disease. It's telling you that you need to go look at them right now. So the key is in the timing. It tells you when this patient needs attention, right? Like there's a lot of... Um, there's a company that has an accelerometer that you can wear on your wrist that will alert somebody if you fall down, right? So alerting people for help is turning out to be one of the bigger things that a lot of these newer technologies are going to be used for, especially they work better the more data points you have. This is a, um, an apartment in a senior living center, and people just put motion sensors all over the place, and you can do all kinds of things with the data you're collecting from these sensors. Um, this, uh, this is actually, I skipped a slide, but this is a telemedicine type thing where this company is doing a tele-rehab. This is Philips. I told you all Philips was getting into this. Philips introduces aging well services 
to bring personalized connected health offerings to help seniors stay at home. They help them do rehab at home rather than go someplace to do you know, other types of rehab. And the reason they're able to do this is because they have the data to do this, A, from their EHR, which, everybody, which they're gonna have access to, and B, from their genome. All right, so what we're gonna be doing is combining, remember I talked about genomic data earlier, you're gonna be combining genomic data and data from your EHR to infer things about people and help them to live at home. Samsung's got something called the Remo, sort of like this, but it's really, they're really dedicating it towards seniors. It's got a nice screen and it'll alert your, it's got a concierge, you can press and hold and call somebody if you need help. It'll um, alert your kids, like my Apple Watch will tell me if my pulse goes above 120 when it knows I'm just sitting there, it alerts me that something's going on. And I'm part of this program. Do any of y'all have a cardiogram on your Apple Watches? Cardiogram will let you know if you go into AFib. It'll tell you, like, call your doctor now, all right? And that's the sort of thing that people are going to get used to and use more and more. Uh, Apple is in this. Uh, if any of y'all watched, did y'all watch WWDC this week, the Worldwide Developer Conference? This is going to be a sign of who's nerds in the room. Anybody watch it? One nerd. There you go. Um, did you watch all the sessions, sir? Or just you watched the main session? Yeah, yeah. But there were so many sessions that were devoted to healthcare. And essentially, what I think Apple is going to be able to pull off, just because they're the biggest company in the world, is they're going to get everybody to standardize electronic healthcare records in their format. So I think what we're about to see is an explosion in the practicality of the use of electronic healthcare systems, electronic healthcare records uh, to take care of people. They just introduced, I mean, these are different sessions, just, just program after program that had nothing to do except with health, and it was using, it was combining sensor data and EHRs, and I've talked about this before. I believe ultimately all your EHR data, where it's going to live, it doesn't really live any place right now, I think it's going to live on the blockchain. Bitcoin may live, Bitcoin may die. The part of Bitcoin that will live is the blockchain. And I think your electronic healthcare records and your, your general hospital records, your money records, all that is going to live on the blockchain. But all this information working together is something called ambient intelligence. And what ambient intelligence is, it's a further step from artificial intelligence. It means that things are context aware, they're personalized to you. They adapt to your behavior. Like I said, if I'm sitting down, it knows if I'm sitting down or standing up to let me know whether or not I'm going into AFib. It's transparent because older folks are very, I don't want to call it vain, but one reason why in nursing homes people don't wear the bracelet around their neck uh, you know, to alert somebody that they've fallen is that it's just ugly. People are vain. Older, older folks just really want to look nice, and this, this data is going to be coming from everywhere. So when somebody falls, see there's a sensor up top, either the sensor will detect a fall or another sensor will have learned, this is a learning pattern, another sensor will have learned that this person has not, this person usually stays in the bathroom for 10 or 15 minutes, and if they have not emerged from the bathroom for let's say 30 minutes, that's a problem. I believe this type of adaptive learning is going to be in all the senior, senior living facilities in America, A, because it saves staff, which I know is a big problem, but B, because it's gotten really accurate. You can see it learns your habits in terms of when you bathe, when you go to the toilet, when you cook, and it figures out what your routine is, and if you strongly deviate from that routine, it infers that there might be a problem. Also, when you're cooking, it can notice certain types of sensors will notice if you're doing things in an order that doesn't make sense and over time it can it can detect that you're behaving in a way that may indicate that you have uh, Alzheimer's plus if you go to the bathroom a lot motion detectors there's a study that came out that can infer that you may have a UTI so all these things that are going on right now it, it's all it's being pushed by the fact that we've got so much data that we can infer things from now. 
Now, loneliness is another big problem seen by the aged. Uh, this, by the way, is who takes care of you when you get older. Speaking of loneliness, it goes from the inside to the out. Uh, so the first person that takes care of you is your spouse. The person next most likely to take care of you as you get older is your daughter. Uh, third most likely to take care of you is your daughter-in-law. Isn't that interesting? Before your son. And doesn't that kind of sound sort of right? Haven't you sort of seen that? But the, the pool of caregivers is actually sort of shrinking, and now everybody is writing uh, instances. They're called instances, I suppose, for Amazon Echo to sort of keep people company. And now Amazon is coming out with robots, which I guess is going to be sort of like an Alexa stuck on top of a Roomba that follows you around, seriously, that follows you around wherever you are and checks in and says, hey, you okay? And the reason I went and looked at the job listings for this particular project on Amazon, and they are very serious about sensors and robots and combining the two to keep an eye on you in terms of keeping an eye on you uh, health-wise. Let's see what time we have going on here. All right. A uh, lot of talk about robot companionship. We'll see how that goes, although it is a big thing in Japan. What I wanted to say about housing is uh, if people know they're going to live longer and people are inclined to stay in their house, I believe there's going to be a phenomenon, and this, this already exists in Japan and in Sweden. Uh, Sweden cuts the maximum mortgage term to 105 years. Ask yourself the question, if you're... 60 years, if, you're, if you get a mortgage when you're 40 and you get a 60-year mortgage, which they're going to be offering, at year 80, are you going to be inclined to move out or are you going to be inclined just to stay where you are? This is something I think you're going to see. It's not technically a technological development, but it's something that is going to happen. And everybody's house, I know my house is blinged out with Hue lights and Alexas, and when I get home, you know, it knows to start my playlist. And I have that thing where I can keep an eye on my cat, you know, from far away. So I can be up in my room over there and I'm watching my cat where he's wandering around and defecating on my pillow or whatever it is he's doing while I'm gone because I know he's mad at me. But my house is full of technology. And when I go to a senior living center, I'm going to expect for that to be there too. Clothing, got nothing to say about it except for that clothing that I think is going to help people walk. Uh, boredom or ennui is a huge problem amongst the elderly. This is Pablo Casals who practiced the cello every day until he was um, 95 years old. In fact, when he was 70, he married a 24-year-old. But anyway, he practiced every day when he was, until he was 95 four hours a day and somebody asked why, you know, why are you still practicing at age 95? You're a master. And he says, you know, I'm beginning to think I'm getting a little bit better. So I think it's important for seniors to be in an environment where they have interest and they're interested in things that they love. Loneliness, I know people that play words with friends every night with 20 different people. So I think that may take up some of the slack. Um, people, when they talk about one of their other worries is not having enough friends. I know I'm running out of time here, not feeling needed. I think that's going to be taken up a lot by work. But here's the thing, my final thing, the thing that is they're most concerned about. What seniors are concerned about more than even their health and that y'all can directly deal with, and this is talking about work again, in this study, oh, George Jetson could have a second career like a Regis, blah, 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 blah. Fear of crime, that's what people are really worried about, all right? If you're in your house, all right, that's the one thing you can't, I mean, I suppose you could get one of those uh, ring things and put it, put it on your front door, and that helps you out technologically, but if somebody is breaking into your house, going back to the Jetsons, if somebody is breaking into your house right there and then, that's the thing seniors worry most about, and if y'all can provide so, in terms of senior living centers, really, if you can provide two things, you have covered nearly 60% of those worries. That is some way that their health is being monitored and just keeping them safe. Keeping them safe, weirdly enough, I was very surprised when I read that, keeping them safe is the thing 
that concerns them the most. I've got some data on it. The elderly victim at risk. A lot of distraction burglaries happen where somebody will ring the doorbell at the front. They know it's an elderly house. Somebody will come in the back and, and rob them. Uh, this guy in Britain uh, beat up a burglar. He's 70-something years old. And now all the burglar's friends are saying that they're going to come in and get this guy. All right, where's he going to go? People want to feel safe. The thing I believe seniors want most of all is to feel secure in their home. And if y'all can figure out a way to do that, that's awesome. I know of only one capital crime that's been committed in the villages. Now, there have been lots of drug busts, <laughs> and, you know, and everybody's vaping down there. So I guess that's like a technological improvement that's going on. And when they legalize weed down in Florida, everybody in the United States is going to move into the villages. But as far as I know, there's only been one capital crime in the villages as long as that place has been open. And here's the last thing I wanted to leave y'all with that I think y'all probably have not thought about it, although Steve has. I talked about it with Steve earlier. You know, George loves Rastro, and that's, that's old George Jetson. That's a picture of old George Jetson loving Rastro. Well, there's this fellow named George Church at Harvard, and he's super brilliant. And he's been doing all these longevity studies, and I've donated my DNA to his study so he can try and learn things. And what he has come across is uh, he has eye-popping anti-aging results in mice and also age-reversing tests on dogs. How many of y'all have dogs? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of y'all really love your dogs? How many of y'all have cats? How many of y'all really love your cats? It's hard to really love a cat. <laughs> All right, let's say you got a dog. Let's say you've got a yellow lab. Steve has a yellow lab. Let's say you have a yellow lab. Would you pay $10,000 for that yellow lab to live a healthy extra 15 years? Yeah, everybody in this room would. And that is one thing that might keep you at home longer. All right, this is weird. This is weird thinking, but that's why Mike has me come out here. George said dogs, because I, I was talking with him, and I was like, boy, when you, when, you, when you make people live this long, when people live to 100, you know, you're going to make a billion dollars. And he's like, I'm going to make a billion dollars with dogs. Because who in this room would not pay to let their dog live a long, you know, live twice as long and live healthily? I mean, we all would do that. So that's something that needs to be considered. That'll either keep people at home or y'all can do something at y'all's facilities to enable pets, uh, maybe more than some of them do right now. So anyway, I talked about research flowing into areas, keeping people at home, um, tech flowing in there. So here's how I'm going to end. I talked about uh, move 34. Here's move 78. So Lisa Dole in that go match was just like, I can't believe the computer beat me. I've been completely embarrassed. So in the next game, he, he studied hard, and he pulled a move no one had ever seen in the game of go before. Move 78, and I believe it was in game four. And this is what Wired Magazine said about it. In two moves, Alpha Goal and Lee Sedol redefined the future because Lee Sedol would not have made or even thought of that second move if the computer hadn't thought of that first move that no one had ever thought of before. So let me try and explain that better. It's not human versus machine, it's human and machine. Move 37 was beyond what anybody could fathom, right? Nobody thought that had never been seen before in the game of Go. But then came move 78, which never would have happened if it hadn't hap if move 37 hadn't happened. So if Lee Sedol hadn't played those first three games against AlphaGo, which was Deep Mind, would he have found, and they called move 78 because it's so brilliant, they called it God's touch. In other words, would he have found that if he hadn't had that first game with the machine? So the machine that defeated him also helped him find the way. And what I'm thinking is all these technologies, we may find out that there are things we haven't even thought of. We're worried a bit about all these aging at home technologies keeping people there longer, but it may just be 
that what happens is, is something like Move 78 happens. These technologies that keep people at home are like Move 34, but then we come up with a Move 78 that wouldn't occur to us otherwise, which completely helps the senior, uh, the senior living uh, industry. So what would George Jetson do? Here's what George Jetson, I was talking about this in the car yesterday with some guys. George Jetson wants to be in a place where he has dignity, you know, where, where people treat him well. He wants to have the things around him, either the people or the animals that he loves. So is all this technology going to compete or augment uh, y'all's business? It would seem to me at first it's competing, but I think ultimately it's going to augment and make y'all's facilities that much the better. Thank you all very much for your time and attention and letting me go a little bit long.